The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. It's welcome to the conversation, uh, Paul Russell. Paul, good whatever it is to you. How are you, man? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Good whatever it is. Do, do we have a, a time that we're saying it is? No, because just, because like this is it away it's, by the outside. It's, it's all on demand these days, see, mate. So so people True. people may pick this up in the morning and we say, oh, good afternoon. They go, it's not afternoon, it's morning. Hang so on a minute. it's good whatever people are listening or watching to this podcast. So lovely to see you. So nice to be with you. Um, I kind of talked a bit about you in the last podcast in the audio version. Um, I've known you for now more than. 20 years which is terrifying and today just by chance i had a friend come through dunedin from huntley who was in my wedding party and in the space of two days uh, sorry in the space of one day you were also in my wedding party ironically as one of new zealand's foremost drummers playing the bass so it's a bit of a surreal day for me that i've got uh, people who I haven't seen for a very long time. The friend who came through today, um, she I've known her for 25 years. Um, and then there's you. And so there's all I'm having a bit of a flashback day, to be honest, about life, the universe, and everything for the past 20 years. Life flies, man, and it's all coming back around. And look at us. Look at us now, 20 years on. It is it is pretty terrifying to think. I was um thinking that perhaps my car won't last till the end of sort of the next 12 months i feel like i'll probably need another car sort of it's still a good car it's getting okay. towards the end it's probably 13 years old now and i thought crumbs if i buy a car that lasts me another 13 years uh i'll be approaching 60. but that's it will you have a car that lasts you another 13 years don't or know in five years are we going to have cars man? don't know i know yeah that's what the last car i ever buy i'm starting to think that way i'm starting to think about the house i'm living in at the moment it's kind of a big it's not it's not in West Auckland, but it feels like a big West Auckland monolith. It's all bricks and you know masonry blocks and that kind of stuff, stairs all over the place. And I'm thinking I'd, I'd love one day to build a house like up in the hills above Dunedin. And I'm thinking if I was going to build a house, would that possibly be my last house? Like would that be the last place I live? Would I therefore want to build it on one level so that when my currently rooted knees become even worse, I don't have stairs? And it's it's a very weird That's feeling to start thinking you about get, that. Yeah. Easy access routes. You got to get your your stair lift ready. Um, you got to get your angled concrete up to the front door. You got to think about: is there a handy bus route uh, for when you can't drive? Where's the nearest GP? Where's your chemist? Man, we're we're getting to that age where we need to start thinking ahead of these things. I know it's terrifying but to yeah, think. Matt, it's well, terrifying. we don't have a whole lot of DIYs left in us. That's that's the reality. <laughs> I know. I mean, you know, you can't be like, cool. Give me another twenty years. I'm going to do a recondition another house and figure it out. <laughs> we're like, nah. We want no lawns, uh, brick and tile, easy care, good Wi-Fi, heat pump, just simple life. Man. It, it is age is an interesting thing and, and all those things i don't know if you find it the same but all those things that people told you come true you know it's like it, you know it'll sneak up on you yeah it has um when you're in your 40s you'll still feel like you're in your 20s or 30s but my physical body doesn't but, it, but everything else yeah everything else my head does yeah, yeah. um and so, so your your rooted knees did they come did they come on in your in your 40s uh, pro, i played i mean i don't know if you can remember but i played a shit ton of basketball uh, through my teens and right through my 20s. Um, I probably did a fair bit of damage to them then. But then I also played things like squash and tennis, all these kind of jarring sports where I was you know, changing direction quickly and stuff. So, yeah, pro probably late, I couldn't tell you exactly, but late 30s to early 40s. I definitely did my back in my late 30s. I can remember the moment I did it. I was playing touch rugby and I just sidestepped and my back went tink. And I was like, oh, I've pulled my back. No big deal. You've done that before. Went and got um, x-rays because it wasn't going away. And the doctor's like, oh, you know, she did a little bit of mild arthritis. And I'm like, I'm 30 fucking seven. What are you talking about, a bit of yeah, mild yeah. arthritis? So. Uh, yeah, that's, that's young, man, mm. arthritis. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know these things. So I'm, I'm an osteopath now. This is the thing, you know, we, we haven't seen each other in so long. In those intervening years, I'm, I'm now a responsible <laughs> semi-responsible adult with a with a career and all sorts so so i can talk to you about arthritis and that, <laughs> that and, sounds, and um that sounds like an interesting beyond, podcast <laughs> yeah that'd be fascinating thanks very much compensation thresholds and all the rest 
Do you feel like a grown up since? Because we, I'm going to go through a bit of your history in music. I want to do that because you're the guy okay. that so many people go. Where do I know you from? I, I bet you you hear that because you've been in so many different uh, iterations of bands and music, and you know, back into your literal high school days that have been on screen in front of people. That that I, I do want to go through a bit of that, but. Is that the moment for you? Because what I was going to say is, you know, musicians are famously not grown ups, but it was it getting a real job that finally made you feel like the grown up? Because that didn't happen to what in your thirties. Yeah, but no, no, I didn't. I didn't qualify as an osteopath until my fortieth year. So I started studying in my mid thirties um, when we were living in the UK. But no, I still don't feel like a responsible adult. <laughs> and I've, I've been talking to friends that, and people our age about this recently, and it's. Yeah, you, you, you're waiting. I'm wait, I'm still waiting. I'm waiting for the point where you feel like the people that you saw when we were younger looking up and they were in their 30s and 40s and seemed so old at the time and seemed, you know, to have everything together and to have all the plans. I don't feel like that. Yeah, I cer yeah certainly don't feel like that. But I wonder how, say, my kids and who, like, well, my kids know me better, but, but you know, people younger looking at us at this age, do they see us as the responsible adults? It's weird. I don't know if you grapple with that, but it's like I don't I don't feel like I've grown up yet, but I feel like I should. So it's perception. Perception is reality. So you're talking to a twenty year old today, will we be the old doddery farts that have oh, we got, totally a, got a mortgage? I've got and, a good story for that, right? Yeah, so I, I'm you always like to think you're still a bit down with the kids, right? And so I was in I think a North North Beach surfwear shop. Uh, and this is summer and I'm with with the kids and shop attendant comes up and she's uh i don't know she's millennial or, or something i don't know late teens 20s um and she sees my t-shirt and it was uh, like a had a record sort of vinyl thing on it and i i like it and she goes oh um uh, where, where did you get that t-shirt that's really cool and i said oh you know i got it online i told you where i bought it she goes Cause my dad would love one of them. <laughs> Just, and like in an instant, you know, I hear it here. Am I thinking, Oh, sweet. I'm down with the kids and then shot me down. But such is life. Man. I've had, mo gotta ride it. I've had moments through my life that I felt older. Right. I remember when I, it was actually John Aloma as well. When, when the first, when I was older than an all black, that was like, Whoa, right. hang, hang on. This doesn't feel right. And then as you get older, you become older than all the All Blacks. <laughs> and also, well, yeah, we're also older than the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Yeah, it's true. That's uh, a bit scary. Buying a, buying a uh, wheelbarrow, that was a moment? Yeah, it, it's a pretty defining moment, eh? Well, did you get, have you built up your, um, uh, your selection of outdoor tools yet? I have done. Um, certainly when I was living in Auckland, had more tools, but then moving to Dunedin, had to kind of cut back because was, there was just a... We'd already had a, bought a house in Dunedin and there wasn't the space for it, but also there was the cost of sort of traveling them down. So, but yeah, you know, got the, got the lawnmower, got the, the, the tools for trimming the hedge, got all that kind of stuff. So well, I figure that, it's that when you, you feel like an adult, when you start buying things that serve no fun purpose. Now I, no, I, I, really I, maintenance when, when the word maintenance <laughs> enters your vocabulary, that that's, you know, you're getting a bit more old then and responsible, semi-responsible. Well, some of the maintenance can be fun, though. Like, I always find a chainsaw fun. But, like, a wheelbarrow? I'm not old enough to use a chainsaw. <laughs> a wheelbarrow serves no purpose other than work. I don't know. For me, it feels like, although now with my back, the chainsaw is a bit of a problem. So this is where you start to, to go the other way. It's just, I don't know, it's crazy. I also remember yeah, actually... Even the fun of chainsawing is being taken out, man. The... um. I also remember, actually, I was only in my twenties, and I was doing some relief teaching in a school, and they were, um, the kids were playing a game on the computer, having to guess the name of the movie, yeah, or the movie character or whatever okay. it was, yep. like a Wheel of Fortune type thing, and the answer was Little Orphan Ella, Annie, Little Orphan Annie. So this is in the nineties, right? I was in my twenties, and um, I said, oh, you know, it's Little Orphan Annie, and they went without a beat. Oh, we're too young to know who that is. So in my twenties, talking to talking to little E's, I felt old. That's true. I know so, you say you say you're talking about movies, right? And guess who it is? You say that I'm that guy that looks vaguely familiar to a lot of people, and you're right, I do get that. Um the one person that I look vaguely familiar with is uh 
bud from married with children ah what you mean you look similar to her growing up growing up i kind of i i looked a bit like that Mm. who is also i think scott from um uh who's um who's dr evil no 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 different people seth green seth green was scott and you're talking about oh no he's different yeah, okay. da- David Faustino, I think, is the name of the guy, the actor from Memory, who played Bud, the son you're talking about, eh, in Married with Children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. David I Faustino. I used to look like him when I was younger. Yeah. With or, the, the other, and this is just a tangent, there was a smidgen of time where I looked a little bit like Glenn Osborne. Ah. From the, and, and he has part Fijian background. Yeah. And there's something about the eyes, there's something about the goggly eyes that I kind of looked a bit like him. Um, yeah. I had a wake-up call. Side track, sorry. Oh. I had a wake-up call with age once when someone pointed out to me that on the day of my birth, I was closer to the end of World War II than I was to today. That knocked me on my ass because that was about 10 years ago as well because I was born in the 70s, right. so the end of World War II was only 30 years ago. So by the time I was like 32, 33, I was already, my birth date was already closer to the end of World War II than it was to today. And I think about that and I think about what we used to watch like we watch movies with the kids now and I'm sure you've done this as well that are from the 90s and it's the Toy Stories or it's the Disney's or it's the whatever and we think how amazing these are but when I was a kid let's say in the 80s watching something that old would have been from the late 50s and I'm like hang on that's not right because my the the ones that I watched in the 90s were yesterday the 50s 50s were like a million years ago it's just because time speeds up and we get on totally yeah you take it for granted eh? But now, look, man, nineties is coming back. Just, just keep all your old flannel shirts. Look, it's all, it's all coming back, man. L- listening to Belle with Devoe from the nineties, fantastic. Hey, the one. It's a drummer, drummer reference, straight there. Well, let's get into it because this is the thing that I think excites most people, in my opinion. Look, I, let me just Excited. say straight away, this is going. <laughs> this is going to this, this episode of any episode is going to get so many strikes on YouTube because I'm going to go against all sorts of rules of of copyright and stuff. I'll just say that out the front. But let's just have a look at some of these these things that we know you from. Supergroove, how old were you when you started in uh, Supergroove, my friend, as the drummer, the original uh, drummer? So I was 14 years old when I when I met those guys, um, and at that point we weren't super group. We were the low down dirty blues band, uh, and same group of guys, a um, couple of couple of different players there. But um, we became super group, kind of morphed into super group through my teens and into I left when I was 19, I think. So yeah, pretty formative years, but pretty young to get started in the game. So 15-ish to 19-ish, were you actually a drummer before you came on board? Or is this one of these stories where you sort of learnt to play the drums while being in a massively popular band? Nah, no, I had learnt beforehand. So I was a little bit the odd one out. So the rest of the guys had gone to, uh, this is based in Auckland, they were at Selwyn College and Seddon College and they had formed this group called the Lowdown Duty Blues Band and they were already doing some gigs at what was... um, a pretty uh, pretty well-known jazz and blues venue in Ponsonby in Auckland at the time called the Glue Pot um, back in the days. Legendary. And they were people like Midge Marsden and the Karuba Blues Brothers and the drummer for the Karuba Blues Brothers. They didn't have a drummer. They would just play and they didn't have any drums. And the drummer for the Karuba, Karuba Blues Brothers was the teacher at my school. And he was like, oh, you guys need a drummer. You should check out this young kid from Linfield College. And he introduced us. And I went round to, I remember it was Joe's house in Ponsonby. I'm pretty sure it was Ponsonby. And um, he made me a lemon and ginger tea. <laughs> and we sat around. I set up my drums. So, you know, 14 with my little red premiere. And it was just him and Carl, the two of them. And we played uh, Mojo Workin', which is a very, you know, classic kind of blues uh, tune with harp and bass and drums. And it had a drum solo in it. And so we got to the drum, so I played a little drum solo. And um, and that that's that was my uh, audition, if you like, for for the Lowdown Dirty Blues Band. I always... And so I, didn't, had, I hadn't met the other guys yet. At this point, I hadn't even I hadn't met Shay. So Shay and I went on to become pretty tight, and I obviously did stuff with him. And um, I didn't meet Shay for the first probably two months of rehearsals. <laughs> so and then, and then he was there, and he was playing. Weirdly enough, Shay never used to sing. Shay used to be rhythm guitarist right at the back and Carl was the main vocalist and at the time we had 
uh, a guy called Ned Natai on guitar at the front, and he was the main singer. And he now uh, works with Fat Freeze Drop and Black Seeds and and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, he was the original guitarist, and Shay was at the back. And Shay would come on to do one song in the whole set, which was a song called Soul Man, um, and kind of switch it up. And then suddenly there's this this epic kind of soul voice. And of course, you know, it goes without saying that he was a waste sitting at the back playing rhythm guitar. But that's that's where he started. I've always thought, and you've probably had this conversation a million times with a million people, um, but there are some iconic bands from around that late 80s through to the 90s, early 90s in New Zealand. And you think, you know, Exponents, and you think, well, a bit earlier, but things like Dee Dee Smash going into Dave Dolan, and you think, and Supergroove's right up there. And I've always thought for a bunch of teenagers to be able to be listed as this iconic band um, in that era, it, it must be something you're proud of, surely. It is, yeah. Um, and certainly looking back on it, uh, I do feel quite proud. You know, it was a very different era. It was a very grassrootsy. There was none of this. There was no exposure to online platforms and stuff where you can increase your audience. You know, if you wanted to go and meet people, you had to go and literally meet people. So I think with Supergroup, we were very fortunate that our manager, who was a guy called Stuart Broughton, was quite visionary. Um, and he had us on the road quite a lot. And he developed this idea of, uh, maximizing your exposure by doing uh, we would do a high school show and then we would perform outside a record shop and then we'd do an all-ages show and then we would do uh, our 18 show like you sometimes play three or four times in a day in one town but that's how critical mass kind of happened it was yeah. just slowly incrementally and you just do it relentlessly um, but it was they're all great memories good formative stuff and you look back on it you think yeah we were part of that era that was breaking ground and providing an opportunity and a platform where that infrastructure was able to be built around. I mean, you think of things like a lot of the high school tours that happened for bands that came after that. I think that was, um, you know, I can't take credit for any of that. that. That was all sort of part of those management decisions for us in the early days that I think kind of laid the groundwork for that sort of stuff. So in some ways I, um, I joke about now in New Zealand, it's possible it's possible to be a rock star. Like, you know, you have 660s, you have LAB, you have these guys that are uh, living the dream and, and not only got the exposure, but making some really good money out of what they do commercially. Um, yeah. I kind of feel like uh, I was maybe one of those all blacks from the amateur era <laughs> where you kind of, you have a bit of exposure, you have a bit of kudos, you, you put a bit of stuff out and then it's like, sweet bro, back to work, yeah. let's go, you know. <laughs> It is, um, uh, again, this kind of question is probably one that's that's bandied around people of my and our era forevermore, but, you know, the the they were like a hot fire, you know, Super Rude was there, they burnt really brightly, then they were gone. And the way I've always described it, and you can tell me if I'm completely wrong with this, is that like when the second, it seems like Super Groove and the cornerstone of Super Groove was Shay's voice and the horns. And it feels like they moved into a period where Shay wasn't there, and I, and I often say they got rid of Shay. I don't actually know what happened there, but Shay wasn't there, and the horns disappeared, and it just wasn't Super Groove anymore. And I wonder, do you think because it was just they were just a bunch of young kids, basically, it was never going to be a long term thing, or could it have been something that went on, you know, for for a decade and become something more than it was? Uh, I think it it did change direction and it did sort of implode on itself. So me commenting, I guess, on on the latter part of that journey. It's not really fair because I wasn't part of that process. Mm. So, so I can't really, I can only speculate like, like all of us, but, um, uh, but looking at it, I would agree from, from a punter perspective, I think when, cause I left before Shay, um, but when Shay left and the horns left, they, they definitely changed the sound that people had come to recognize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that was a difficult thing. It's not to say that what they were doing, wasn't catchy or wasn't innovative or good. It was just different to what they had set up as the expectation, which was really kind of a party band. It was very, it was really wasn't very serious. And and I, I guess it, it kind of seemed to go down a little bit more of a serious path. And so yeah, stylistically it, it definitely changed. And I would agree that the um the interesting ingredients of it as uh as a young band was 
uh, was the youthful energy and the zeal. It was Shay's voice mixed with the, uh, the sort of Beastie Boys-esque uh, sort of Carl vocals and the combination of that. And the fact that it was kind of rock, but then it wasn't. It had horns and it was funk. Uh, and it was that whole thing mixed together. So I think it was quite a melting pot of stuff, which which made it quite unique. And so when you took away some of those unique elements, yeah, I, th- I think it wasn't quite the same. It is interesting to talk to you, though, because you have been involved in a lot of New Zealand music. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the video and stuff that we've watched shortly, but, you know, Supergroove to Shafu to 8, which I want to talk about in a sec, to a new project you've got coming up, which I'm excited to talk about as well. But then there's a bunch of other things you've been involved in, in music. Like, you forgive me because I don't know the name of it, but, you know, there was the reggae tour just recently of recent years that you get pulled on board and you go around. The, it seems like, um, I don't know, is it, is, it a, is it an insult to call a drummer a session drummer? But you've always been sort of involved in some form of significant music or musical performance in the country. At, you know, at some stage every few years. Yeah, no, I, I, and, and it's, it's not an insult at all to call a drummer a session drummer, and I was a session drummer for many years. So after I left Supergroove, I would consider myself to be a session drummer. And, and so something like Eight was, was more a project that was, um, uh, was a creative expression for me personally. Um, and, and working with Shay was a little bit more relational in that way. But, but yeah, I, I was a, a hired gun in that sense. So I do, we'll do a lot of studio work, studio work for people. And, and this is the beauty of New Zealand. They're, you know, cheap as this three day, three degrees of separation, you know, so when, when that exposure that I had at a young age with Supergroove gave me the opportunity and the platform to be able to do a lot of that other stuff. Yeah. I, I remember being at a festival one year and um, there was a band on the stage who played a Supergroove song and I knew the guys in the band and they came off stage talking about how um, how intimidating it was to be playing a Supergroove song on a stage in front of 20,000 people in front of the Supergroove drummer. <laughs> Uh, that was brilliant. That was the. That was, are, you, are, you that, not, are you not at liberty to say what the no, song was or who the band? Was? It was the lads. It was the lads at Mata Mata. Okay. Yep. They, they played a Supergroove nice. song, and and Steve was like, Steve's the drummer for the lads. Well, he was at that stage. Probably, no, still is. Was like, you know, yep. I, I just remember the comment about you know the drummer from Supergroove is in the audience, and I didn't know you then because we met after that right. um, through mutual connections. Um, but yeah, it's it's because even that makes me kind of think. There's the the sound that Supergroove had. It's iconic. It is there, there is iconic music. I mean, if you're going through music yep. from the last century, if you if you're having a last century party and you want New Zealand music, Supergroove's in there, man. There's probably two or three tracks that are top twenty, top ten that are going to be on be played during that um during that party. Yeah, and and I I would agree. You know, I th- I think it's become part of the New Zealand canon. I think particularly of that era. You know, and and I think because it happened in that time where there were fewer bands and fewer exposure, it's it's kind of been more concreted into the ethos of things a little bit more, if that makes sense. It's I probably a, a little bit like now. This is this is going to sound disrespectful. It's not supposed to, but you know, when you catch a fish, you know, it's the, it's this big when you catch it, and then like a week later, it's this big. And then, you know, a year later, it's this big. And then all of a sudden, you're telling a 10-year-old, and the fish was like, you know, this big. Right, so right. The, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the positivity the story get, of Supergroove has taken on a life of its own. Ma- ma- maybe so. Okay. I mean, it's like it's like perhaps when you're, I don't know, but like when you're in a relationship, all the good things seem to be amplified and the bad things maybe get forgotten about if you if you keep that on. You know, you remember the good boys weekends away, not the cleaning up the vomit the next day or the whatever it is, and they tend yeah. to amplify the good thing. And, and, and it's a positive. It's like... We we remember Supergroove so um, so generously and, and nicely, but then we probably also go, oh, it was the best time of my life, and it probably was because we were seventeen with no back pain or knee pain, j- jumping around <laughs> yeah, all over the funny. place, spent you know going going to bed at four in the morning and getting up at six for work because we could. So there's that element of this music is I'm training a puppy at the moment. And we've got one of those clickers, you know, and that song sitting inside my head is like my clicker for how I felt at that moment physically i had no burdens i had no mortgage i had no kids it was just that song relates to that part of my life which means that song is the reason for that part of my life you know what i mean yeah yeah no that totally makes sense and you're absolutely right you know the, the, at, at that age there's there's so there's so many less responsibilities and as you say you, you don't have a whole lot to worry about these are uh, dream days of your youth 
And so if you if if anyone is is able to be part of that little window of experience, then yes, you're going to gravitate and remember that in a very special kind of way. But you're right. It's funny the way things take on a life of their own, yeah. and because uh, because I I hear because I don't get it because I'm you know I'm just me and I've just gone through this trajectory of life and and you know me and my friends know me and 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 you know I don't consider myself to be. Um, famous or anything like that but 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 there is some you know notoriety and fame around that history with super groove and with shay and other things um and i remember doing a a workshop at some at a school for um uh the senior music students this is coming back and i was doing some stomp stuff which i, I guess, guess we'll talk about as well um and i was talking to the music teacher there and she was going is it true that um that you can play like uh at 120 beats per minute, like with no metronome, just because that's, you just know how to do it. Like, like it, apparently, apparently some rumor had got around that I, that I was <laughs> that tuned in to the universe that I could just sit down and I just knew how to play at 120 beats per minute. I just knew exactly what that was. And I don't know where that had come from. And it's certainly probably not true. Um, but I just, I thought it was hilarious. I was like, what? But you know they were quite serious. Like you know, I heard this about you. That's great. Like, please, yeah. please say you told her yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I just unfortunately <laughs> wasn't able to demonstrate. We didn't yeah. have a mention, but you know, I'm sure she took my word for it. Tennis elbow today. I can't quite show you, but I definitely can do that. It's no problems at all. Oh, God. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, yeah, if it wasn't for that dratted elbow injury. <laughs> It's also, I, I think I was listening to someone once talking, it was it was 20 years ago or so they were talking, and they were talking about how, like, so, so say it's the year 2000, and they were talking about how the uh, an old lady was talking about how life was so much better in the 1950s. And the response from these two people talking, it was on a radio show, was, well, of course it was for her. She was young, and she was vibrant, and, you know, <laughs> she, she had all these things. And so we often, I think, look back and we think how times were better, but it's probably not times were better, it's that... It's not even that we were better, but, you know, we enjoyed life maybe a bit more. But in saying that, I'm not saying we don't enjoy life now, but you know what I mean? It's like if you if you, if you you think that this area or period of life is better because you're feeling better about it, it relates to then that period as being better. Well, it's really more a personal thing, I think. Like music. They talk about music. I love music still every day, you know, it's, it's playing all the time. But I do think about that time very fondly, and I think that relates more to who I was there than the music then. Yes, and sorry, I was just distracted by something that came up, it pinged and came up on the screen. So I was totally listening. Mm -hmm. I was not tuning out, but I lost my own train of thought. And I thought I had something really cool to say. And then the thing pinged on my screen now, and now I've gone blank. But that's all right. right. Well, let's talk about, um, you, you mentioned, for example, the band 8. Uh, and you were yes. a member of the band 8, the drummer. And you said it was more of a creative process. We play a little bit of this. And this... Eight was also a fairly legendary band amongst many circles. Uh, a story that I have heard. Here's some here's some stories for you. Oh, you said you watched the conversation I had with um, Dave Gibson, yeah? So you know that I yes. like to ask questions about that kind of can you drum at 120 beats a minute. Um, uh -huh. Was that you guys were basically self-producing albums and they were selling out of Real Groovy and Real Groovy couldn't figure out why before you produced anything like with a with an album like with a with a label or anything is that true it is true yes but there was also uh, a reason for that because um we uh at the time we were based in auckland and so at the time real groovy records was quite a a, a kind of mecca of independent music and and still sure. is. um and and again this is going back to a time where you you know, you weren't downloading and streaming on Spotify and doing that sort of stuff. It was like you wanted to have an album in hand and you needed to find a way to sell that. And um, so we thought as a emerging band, uh, yes, that story is true, but we kind of created it in the sense that we didn't sell anything anywhere else. So we only sold our CDs at Real Groovy for so you those you drove yeah. people there. So at the gigs you went, we drove people there. yeah, at the gig you went. Look, thanks for coming. If you want to pick up an album, head to Real Groovy. You can get it at Real Groovy. Yep. And so we didn't have it available across a whole bunch of shops where you sell three. We had it at Real Groovy where we would sell a thousand, and then they would be like, "Who the hell are these guys?" Mm. So it also makes me think about. I remember going to a, an eight gig, 
um, at a, a somewhere up in Ponsonby or K Road or something like that. And it ended up being just after you released your first sort of, you know, produced mainstream album, if I can put it that way. And then that was the last gig you ever played. And I'm interested as well about music in New Zealand. And I've talked to other musicians about this, about the longevity of what can happen in New Zealand. And I wonder if it's so often um, attached to financial reward. You know, when we're in our 20s or whatever, we can sleep on couches and we can do this and we can do that. But then we get a bit older and we find a partner and we have kids and then there's rent or there's a mortgage and it's a bit harder to do all those sort of things on the cuff. And within the New Zealand music scene, it seems obviously the rewards financially have been, I mean, you mentioned 660 and, and LAB and I guess you, the Lord would be the pinnacle of the income earners at the moment, um, yep. that it's it's... It's, it's ironically it's maybe even a little bit what I'm going through at the moment with what I do here at some point it has to become either an income or a hobby was that sort yeah. of what happened with eight no it was actually um but thanks for asking yeah. <laughs> um but uh, I totally hear what you're saying and you're right um and and I think that dilemma is uh the thing the point at which all creative artists have to have to find a balance and say yes this is what i'm going to shoot for and it's going to be viable and it's going to be um take care of my mortgage and my kids or i'm going to do something else i'm going to do that creatively Mm. there's that whole process that happens as well but we that wasn't the driving force for the change in eight i think we we were uh we lost the creative vision for why we started in the first place and what we were trying to create and actually it was because of the fear of us commodifying what we were doing that we felt we were losing sight of what we started with, if that makes sense. What, what do you because, mean by commodifying? Explain that to me. Um, making money from your music. and, and So you, and were worried about, the, you, you were worried about becoming too commercial? No, no, no. Not worried about being com, becoming too commercial, but worried about uh, it's, it's the process of what trying to make your uh uh, the process of trying to make your art make money um detracts from the the essence of you just being free to create and not having those um uh those pressures so Uh, so let me let me let me ask you this so are you saying on some levels you didn't want to be a sellout that primarily you wanted to be just about the art and you would have to compromise that to make it commercially viable and you rather than compromise that you decided it's a good time to wrap up. No, I can't say that with honesty <laughs> because we never quite reached a point where um, we we were given the opportunity. Well, not not given the opportunity. We never reached a point where we we crossed over into actually being commercially viable. If, right. if what we had have done with those radio friendly tunes had have suddenly gone Coldplay and we were like mega famous band. I'm I'm sure we probably would have done another album. Um, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, you know, you're juggling a whole lot of variables there. But um, I think one thing that we found that in the process of trying to write the next album is that we were already trying to second guess what would be suitable for radio. We were right. already trying to second guess what our audience had heard and how we could present them something that they were expecting. And so we were already starting to kind of cookie cutter the creative process and one of the challenges which is also one of the great benefits that we have in New Zealand is uh, New Zealand On Air. Amazing organisation um, helping emerging artists and, and creating New Zealand content and so we had a lot of support from New Zealand On Air which is great but of course what happens partly with that is that you start second guessing the next process and you think oh we can get some can we get some money for another single or can we make a video if you want to make a video then oh actually it's got to be a radio friendly single mm. so actually it's a radio friendly single it's got to be three and a half minutes then you got to get to the chorus in the first way and so suddenly you're kind of designing your music to fit these other things rather than just creating the art that you want to make so when we first started with eight we would have songs that that were never played the same twice you know, and, and, and they might, and, and one song would merge into another and we would spend time just jamming on stuff and these ideas. And, and that's the sort of stuff that's fantastic. And I love bands that do it. It's not very commercially viable and it doesn't really tick the boxes for rock radio and it doesn't, you know, really get you New Zealand on air funding. Um, Mm. And so that was where we were sitting, you know, we had this expectation from 
the record company and all, all who were fantastic in, in supporting us and helping us. We had, expect, yeah, well, not expectation, but we were putting expectations on ourselves based on sort of the little a little bit of, of success that we had had and how that success had come about. And so we started to second guess the process. Wow. And then it all became a bit too much. So I remember, you know, sitting with Bruce and we were trying to, we we're writing these tunes and we we're starting to construct them. We we're thinking, you know, and they, they were quite commercial and we we're, we we're sort of sitting back and saying, is this actually what we want to be doing? Do we, do we want to do this? Do we want to go down this route? You know, and, and we made a choice then that actually, no, we don't. So that that's that's where it was. I don't know if that really answers your question. And the sort of things that you're talking about were definitely factors in the mix. Yeah. Because, you know, we were in relationships at this point. I, I was married, Bruce was married. And so we were hitting those crossroads of like, yeah, but um, how are you paying the mortgage and, and how much longer are you going to be jumping in a van and driving around the country and playing all these gigs when you're not? getting any money for them, <laughs> you know so so all of those things were in play but I, I would like to think it was a little bit more of a creative choice as well do you think that it would be possible for a band to make like tight as tight radio singles yet on stage be loose and creative with them or do you think the audience that would come to see them on stage would react like i'm thinking about your song I'm, in theory i'm not suggesting you guys didn't do what was best for you but i'm just thinking about what you've talked about that set of kind of you know no song ever say sounded the same twice do you think that it would be possible for a band to be able to do that the radio airplay is tight as tight but their sets are far looser maybe the songs don't quite sound the same maybe they do flow more differently or would the audience react badly to that because they've come to hear the radio singles I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know how it will go down. I know, and I would like to think that it would be, hopefully, received pretty well. And loads of bands do that. And a lot of bands that I have a lot of respect for, I would never hear on the radio. That's the thing. Yeah. And I would love, you know, a lot of the bands that I want to go and see, and like, you know, one of the most memorable, well, not most memorable, but I, I, a show that I really appreciated being a part of and seeing as a fan was Sigur Rós when they came to New Zealand, you know, and uh, Icelandic band, very um, soundscapey music, um, very uh, cinematic, but you're never going to hear them on commercial radio. But that was actually one of the things that um, made me think a bit more as well is like, why, you know, commercial radio and, 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 and that side of things is, is, is what it is you don't have that's not the only way to to make a living perhaps in new zealand with music because we're such a small market yeah yeah you can't, yeah. Get, you can't widen your scope enough you know but then hey iceland's not exactly very big and a band like sigur Rós have just done what they've done and they've just been consistent another band that has crossed over into that hugely commercial success and everybody knows them is the cure but you look at their story and they are constantly, even now, just surprised by their backstory that they just did what they did and people gradually picked up on it and it became a sound and became a thing, but they weren't trying to fit anything. And so what I would like to think is that you, you uh, like any creative artist, that you just, you find what it is that you want to say, you find how you want to express yourself and you stay true to that and 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 if that has some commercial element to it great but don't you know you don't ever want to swing what you're doing for the sake of of trying to make it what i hear you saying and i've said this week to you twice and both times you said no that's not quite it but what i don't hear you saying is it's a little bit like what's the focus and what's the byproduct you know i talk about this a lot with people just doing creative things if the focus is making money um often that is not as you, sometimes it's not a success. I'm not, I'm not actually relating this to you guys being your focus, but if someone's got a creative output and their focus is making money, they're, they're, they're taking away from their creative product. But if their focus is making the product and the byproduct is they make money from it, and I wonder what I hear you saying on some levels is um, the by, at the start, the byproduct was perhaps radio airplay and the focus was just creating yep. songs or creating music and you were yes. worried that the focus was becoming creating airplay which means i guess the byproduct is creating music and that sounds awful you're you're exactly right yes 
Yeah. I got um, it. That means third time lucky I got it. Woohoo. Boom. Yeah. So what you said the first time, but but yeah, the third time is is correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I've jumped around a little bit in your timeline, but I do want to jump to one place because how can we not uh mention uh, the time you spent with Shafu after uh mm -hmm. after stereogram as well. Stereogram, I mean supergroup. Evening lads. How are you? Yeah, one of you chaps is a bit of an all right singer then, yeah? <laughs> well, like, me mate here plays a bit of keys. And over there we've got some lads who play as well, right? So I'm thinking, you fancy having a bit of a jam with us, eh? And let me tell you something about, about this song. And uh, I am going to let the start of the song play. It'll get us kicked off YouTube, which is fine. But um, I love Paul watching you play drums. And I'll tell you why after we see the start of this. When you sit down right here, the people watching... This will get us barred from YouTube. So I've said of you numerous times, Paul, when I've been talking to people about you and your style, it's very easy and you hear often about uh, people talking about being one with their instrument. You know, someone's got a guitar and they sort of, they flow with it or they've got a flute or they've got a violin and they become one with their instrument. There aren't many dr drummers, if any, that I've seen sort of become one with a drum set. But it's how I always describe you when I'm watching you perform. And it's like, it's, it's, it's obviously more difficult because you're, you're stationary, but there's something about the way you move and there's something about the way that you interact with your drums. That, that's how I've described you to other people when talking about your style of drumming. You sort of become one with the drum set and you see it in this and you see it in the way you move. Um, but yeah, your, your history with Shea Fu must be, must be kind of fun as well. Coming out of, oh, did I say stereogram before? I just heard you repeat that to me. Yeah, yeah, that's um, all right. In my head, Super Groove. Coming out of Super Groove, um, into basically what being a session drummer for Shea Fu, that was a, that must have been a fun time as well. Oh, awesome! And again, it's, you know, I, I feel very lucky, you know, that that I was able to to continue that ride, um, particularly with an artist like Shea. He's a great friend, but he's also, I think, he's an icon of New Zealand music. And for sure. I was really fortunate. I mean, you talk about us getting old and <laughs> um, older. And I was really lucky recently. I was able to play on the 20th, 20th anniversary of the Navigator album. Wow. So that Dude, is, I remember when that came out. <laughs> yep. Same. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so as part of the Auckland Arts Festival fairly recently, uh, Shay did the um, Navigator album in its entirety. And, and he very kindly got a few of us sort of OG players from that era to come back and, mm -hmm. and perform that song and Misty Frequencies. So nice. we did a couple of tracks at the Town Hall in Auckland. And it was the first time, so we see in that video clip, uh, you know, you got uh, Chip Matthews on bass, you got Godfrey DeGruy on keys, you got P Money on the cut, you got James doing samples and Zebby on guitar. All of us were together in the same room and we realized we hadn't played together in over 15 years. Wow. So we did a rehearsal together on a Friday night. We did the show on the Saturday. This was just coming out of level two and the Auckland Arts Festival had started at level two. They had to cancel a whole bunch of acts because you weren't allowed more than a hundred people. I flew up to Auckland on the Friday and they had just made the announcement to say that they were going to level one. So the gig went ahead and it just gave it this whole extra energy because of course, not only were people out in support of the album as they should be, um, but there was just this whole energy of Jeepers, we're free again, and this is, we're, we're allowed to go party. And so this, it was a really good vibe and and really nice to revisit that. So it's actually pretty fresh in my head. Um, I've done a, a couple of interviews around the the anniversary of Navigator as well. So that whole process is, is something I've been um, just rethinking and revisiting in my own head anyway. And awesome opportunities, like just musically, uh, in terms of relationships, in terms of, um, uh, you know, really cool performances and really cool memories and being able to travel. You know, we went across Australia with that. We went across the UK and there's some really epic moments with that group. And what about, I mean, I guess the world wants to know as well, why wasn't there like an award-winning acting career off the back of that music video? That's probably quite important to, to follow uh, up as well. Probably because I've got the, uh, in that video, I've got probably the Dick Van Dyke of English accents. <laughs> <laughs> All right there, Mary Poppins. Um <laughs> That would be, it would be very funny because I spent nearly, well, n over nine years in the UK. Uh, you know, if I played that to my UK friends, I'd be like, 
easy, mate. Pro- probably um, means you'll do a better one now, though. Did you intro the song of the town hall like that? Did you do the full intro for I, for Shay? I should have. You should have. They, they missed the trick there. Totally. So <laughs> I, yeah. Wow. Maybe we could go back and do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you, I, I would. I never made it to Shorten Street, man. Uh, so. Doesn't matter. I've been there three times. It's nothing special, bro. I've seen you on Shortland Street, man. I've seen you. <laughs> Shortland Street's so hilarious. Talk about three degrees of separation that um, my little sister was a huge Shortland Street watcher. I played two different characters a year apart, and they used to show replays in the morning from like months ago and then the new episode in the evening. I was on on the same day in the morning and the evening playing two different characters yeah. on Shortland Street. Oh, that's <laughs> a continuity. <laughs> hilarious. Oops. But I've just started watching MASH again, and I know that, um, you, you know, Colonel Blake is the first uh, first um, colonel in MASH, and then I think it's Colonel Potter comes along. About three or four months before Colonel Potter comes along, the same actor comes on and playing a different character, like he's playing a general or something, and they bring him back. So it's not unheard, right. that's not unheard of. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's still there's still scope for you on Shorten Street, is what you're saying? What I'm saying is, for the amount that Shorten Street pay, I actually ended up turning them, not turning them down. I never just make. Let me just take a step back. I used to fill in occasionally and do little tiny bits here and there, right? But I actually ended up having to say no because I had to take time off work to earn less to go on Shortland Street than I was earning at work anyway. So that was Stepping actually one of the. Stone, no, bro. You know, to Hollywood what? comes calling. They to need what? to see you. It's like your show reel, isn't it? To what? To every bloody need a rugby player in the background audition I ever fucking went to. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you, you could get a part in a commercial, you know, for a Toyota or something. Do you know, know, every every acting gig I ever got, a paid acting gig, I never auditioned for. Literally every every audition I ever did, I never got. And every job I ever got, I never auditioned for. They were all like, oh, we saw you for that. You know, why don't, we want you to come in and do that. And we want you to do this. Not even asking me to try all out for it, just giving them. So it's it was, yeah. So I did an audition for Shortland Street. Didn't get that part, but then got three other parts over the next two or three years based on that audition for a completely different part. Bizarre. That is funny, man. Um, okay, so you're, 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 this is like, this is your life, but done like, Cheer bro styles. Um, so you you finish up with eight, and then there's a period of time, and you and the Farno head off to the UK. And as I understand it, you can fill out the story. Um, <laughs> in my head, you're sitting around in your undies wailing, and uh, your missus signs That's you definitely up. Definitely happening, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> signs you up for an audition for Stomp, um, yeah. which is a massive worldwide brand. Up to and including when you guys got to perform at the closing of the um, London Olympics, and here you come here with your big, uh, your big blue balls there, blue going drums. for it. <laughs> and so you're performing. Is it on Broadway? Is it off Broadway? But it's a pretty prestigious sort of again a cast to be involved with, um, doing something you've never done before. Which yes, it's a percussion, it's a percussion performance, but must be said as it's dance doing dance tell us that story bro yeah you're you're right crazy tangent of life that takes you on on one of those journeys and and yeah my wife had signed me up for the auditions i was hustling in the uk we moved over there to look for sort of more opportunities musically and uh and i and i had some but i hadn't kind of broken through and made that that connection that was like cool this is my gig and um I'd had a bit of a run of bad luck, to be honest. I was in a car accident. I had left some stuff on a train, like molded headphones and video camera, all this stuff. In the space of about three or four weeks, I'd had like three or four things, big things happen that had just sort of really set me back. And 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 again, I was still hustling. I was filling in for this band and that band and driving for four hours to get to the coast to do a gig and then driving back like at someone's wedding or a corporate gig and and filling in and just trying to make ends meet basically i was working during the day uh in central london for a billboard company i was doing all sorts of stuff so uh my wife has uh had signed me up for these open auditions and yeah it came up at a time when i was a bit low i guess because all these sort of sort of bad luck had happened so i went to the audition 
just thinking stuff it you know I, i'm you know i'll just go have some fun the auditions were in brighton we we're based in london so i jumped on a train went down and it was as you say it's, it's a pretty big um enterprise and there were people from all over europe sort of turned up there and, and i hadn't i just i just kind of had blinkers on because of what had happened in the in the weeks preceding and so i just kind of turned up with not a lot of expectation and and uh i saw all these flipping professional dancers limbering up stretching with legs up here and i saw these drummers with their sticks out practicing and some people have been to the auditions like three or four times and they're all like really focused and and i was like shit what have i got myself in for you know <laughs> so i thought oh well i'm i'm probably getting nowhere with this let me just enjoy it you know i might as well just have a day out and the good thing about stomp and 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 i love their ethos is that anyone can be a stomper in in a way you know um so they're not looking for a trained professional musician they're not looking for a tap dancer or, or a dancer they just look for someone who is able to show their personality to get involved and someone who can learn and so we did three or four days of these kind of workshop based things where you're sitting in a standing in a semicircle with about 30 other people or something and they're working through routines they just treat it like a class so they do some hand feet routines and see how, who picks them up who doesn't who moves well who doesn't and we got a first sort of few days, I just thought, man, uh, I don't know how I'm going. It was all kind of very dancey related and hand feet coordination stuff, um, which which I'm okay when I'm sitting behind a drum kit, yeah, but I sure. don't consider myself a dancer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not sort of styling out the moves. Um, and then on day four, they gave us some, they didn't use drumsticks, but they gave us hammer handles and some oil drums and said, right, just you know set up a groove on this and and that was probably the one time that i felt like i had a bit of confidence about what i was doing um finished the auditions and at the end there was about 12 of us left i think and they were like cool thanks very much for your time we'll call you if we need you see you later and it was a good month or so before i heard from them and then they said yeah do you want to come on board we're going to pay pay you to do it we're going to pay you to rehearse the show and and learn it all so yeah long story short that's how i got in i ended up being a cast member in the west end show in london west end that's what uh, I was thinking. So, which was great for me because i had a um had a young family i had my wife and my daughter at the time and so i wasn't cut out for the touring cast so there was a cast that traveled around the world and did all that and then there was a cast in new york and there was a cast in london so thankfully they wanted me in london so that gave us the opportunity for me to be able to essentially have a base, clock in, daughter could go to school, I kind of had my office, you know, go in to do the show. And it's amazing. We were tucked in just behind Leicester Square, Covent Garden, that kind of Piccadilly Circus area. And I did that show for eight years, which is pretty cool. Lots did of good opportunity. Pretty cool. I bet you're in the best shape of your life as well during that. Oh, yeah. It's just, you know, you do <laughs> six or seven shows a week, sometimes 10 if there's a holiday week it's just like going to the gym for two hours and jumping around like a monkey and having fun so yeah very, very good byproduct is that the um i mean of, of the brand that would obviously be the highest profile thing you've been involved with you know stomp as you said is a worldwide brand did that ever get you and i don't mean like oh were you famous but notoriety were you more recognized at all because uh, there's two things right there's you're a part of a massive brand but there's also what sometimes 10 12 of you on stage so you're also one of many did that come with any kind of notoriety at all? No, nah, not not really. I mean, I mean, I mean, very very localized. Um, uh, no, it's not even a fan base in the sense that it's such a transient um, place where you're doing it because you, you're performing in the West End, and predominantly your audience is tourists and people are coming through. You know, right. the, the yeah. West End is famous for that. So people go to London, they want to see a show, but it's not like that they're, they're coming back next week you know so it's just again we we can't imagine doing that in new zealand i i toured um australasia with stomp and we did one week in each of the main centers of of new zealand and that by the end of that one week we we're thinking jeepers are, are we going to fill the auditorium you know whereas you can do it all year round there because it's one of those mecca type places and so yes you have those times where you go to the stage door and there's people waiting outside and they cheer when you come out and they want mm -hmm. want you to sign their their um uh what do you call them the 
the little playlist thing, the book. Yeah. I want you to sign here. The word has escaped me. The play bill, you know the I'm bill talking. play, the bill. Play bill, yep. Something. That thing. Yeah. They want you to sign that stuff or a t-shirt or something and take photos and do all that. But, you know, it's not like they know or remember who you are. I don't, I don't think that, anyway. No, but I think that's really the point you've made there is like you're not, you're not in front of them 50 times. Like if you're following a band, you listen to the song 50 times and you watch the video 100 times. And so they're always in front of your eyes. But yeah, you're right. You kind of go, yeah, you become that guy and you become that personality and they get to know you. I mean, you, I'm, you know, I'm a stage character to them and, yeah. and that's great. You know, there's lots of cool interactions and, and you're making somebody's moment, which is really cool. And, you know, I still think this when you're performing, you know, you're performing like it's the one time that anyone's going to see you, you know, regardless how, how, of how many times you perform. And I always think of this as in, in whatever I'm doing creatively. Um, if I'm going to perform, I want people to have that experience like it's the one time they're going to see it. And so I do love that. However, transient, you might walk out of the stage door and, you know, there's a kid who you have had a massive impact on because they've mm. watched your show. They've been blown away. They've been inspired and, that's kind of what you live for. I think that's oh, pretty cool. And it does do that. I, 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 as we talk, by the way, I'm fading. I'm just going to... So I hope you don't mind. No, 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 not at all. And, and look, we'll, we'll wrap up in a second. I know you've got no, all, right. all of Tauranga to get back to. We do have to talk about the main reason you're here in a minute, which we haven't got to yet. But look, I, I it's that's interesting true. you talk about the small kid you had an impact on. I, I it would have been 90... Actually, it was it was the year that the first Batman came out, so that might have been 1988. I know that because I was wearing a Joker T-shirt. I went to see Cats nice. at, the, at the St. James in Auckland on Queen Street. Um, and it was the first time I've ever seen anything like this. And I just went, I want to be in... Like, so I would have been 12, you know, whatever, 13. Mum and Dad took me to Cats, and I'm just like, I want to be a part of this world. I don't know quite how, but I want to, I want to have some involvement in this world. And, like, I did a bit of that stuff through school and through university um but you know sort of the the entertainment world is still something that i've been attached to and i can i can trace that back to two moments i can remember driving with my dad in the car listening to what then one zb listening to this person going man this sounds like a fun job and ironically thinking and she only works four hours a day um, as a, as a freaking 10 year old i was thinking how to get out of things um but also going to cats these two things and they were really impacting on me as a let's say 10 to 14 year old as to stuff I would love to be able to do when I was you know an adult or growing up so I get it I get the idea of kids seeing you and and saying something yeah totally and and that's the, that's the beauty of of music is the beauty of theater it's the beauty of art that is that it's it's there to inspire and it's it's you know the whole beauty is in the eye of the beholder thing is is, is true you know whatever that moment is for that particular person is is going to be different and unique and so you can't take it for granted in any respect and you know i've had so many of those moments in my life at every stage of my life and i still have them if i see a great artist or i see a great film or i hear a great piece of music that moves me then you're you're suddenly in a particular moment and it takes you to a particular place emotionally it might take you it might take you back to somewhere like that that time of your youth you know that the the beautiful years um or whatever it is and and it's about that creative inspiration so if you can share it um it's a beautiful thing i hope you've enjoyed having a bit of a chat going down sort of memory lanes the memory lanes of paul russell <laughs> I, I have enjoyed it it's good thank you but what i want to talk to you about now briefly is actually one of the reasons we thought we'd do a podcast after all this time is that oh, you yeah, that. you you and bruce who was the lead singer of eight have sort of started mm -hmm. up, well, have started up a new, well, I guess I'll get you to describe it, a new musical initiative called Midwave Breaks. Okay. Yeah. And it's um, interesting, I, I'm finding it interesting hearing your... Uh, your conversation around things like you know the band eight that you were in and what you were uh, what you were about and what you were trying to achieve, what midway breaks is all about, what you what you want to do and what is it? Is it a is is this is this the next thing that you're going to do for the next twenty years? Is it this something on the side? Is this just a creative outlet? I guess in this day and age, it's a lot easier to produce product. I mean, I've said it before. We, I'm sitting in a studio that's putting out four K product, which it costs one one hundredth of what a studio like this would have cost for a tv station 20 years ago 
So it's easy to make and put out and create content this day and age. What's the plans for mid-wave breaks? And tell us more about it. Let me check my teeth first because I'm eating chocolate at the same time as we go. Nice. I think it's good. Um, so, um, mid-wave breaks, yep, me and Bruce. And we're, we're approaching it. At, we're at a different point in life. We're at a different point where we're not, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm an osteopath these days. You know, Bruce does his stuff. We're not <clears throat> um, gunning to try and be um, sort of work working musicians who need to make money from what we do it's not a bread and butter thing so so it's it, there's a there's a freedom in being able to approach the creative process from that point you know without needing to have those expectations um and it is about you know it's interesting we were talking before about those times that take you back to those years when you uh that do and evoke those memories of youth and freedom and less responsibility and all that sort of stuff. So part of what Midwave Breaks is for us is it's harking back to that uh, era of sound that we grew up with that was inspiring for us as young teenagers. We grew up, I was born in the 70s, so I grew up with music of the 80s and the 90s, you know. So for us, that's that's kind of the reference point. So there's this um, a, a fairly sort of purposeful, retrospective nature to the music that we're doing now. Um, we're not, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel in the sense of trying to keep up with the latest thing. We're just, you know, we know, we know where our lane is, if you like, um, and, and we feel pretty comfortable in it. So, uh, part of what was important with this process with me and Bruce is we started this thing before it was midwave breaks. We, we were looking back through, uh, a bunch of, demos and stuff that bruce had 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 a catalog of stuff he's got hundreds of songs the guy's a very prolific um fantastic songwriter um and we kind of collated all that stuff and and realized man there's a lot of stuff here that's really cool and it excited us and that was the important thing it wasn't us sort of sifting through thinking you know is this stuff that that could have an audience we weren't looking at it that way we, we're both at a point where we were not necessarily doing as much music as we had done in the past. And so you miss it, you miss the creative process. And um, so we we wanted to work together and, and so we did. We were just, I think the timing came together because we had moved to Tauranga and then Bruce and uh, his wife had moved to Tauranga as well. And so proximity kind of made it happen. For sure. And so we're like, man, we should get together. We should jam. We should have a listen to those tunes. And and so out of that was like, okay, actually, there's enough here for us to to be creatively inspired. Let's let's work on these tunes together. But we made a point that we wanted to record all of what will be the album uh, before we subjected it to any of those um, more commercial processes, I guess, of of thinking about who might want to listen to it or thinking about whether or not you put it online or do whatever. You know, we wanted to just make an album that me and Bruce were happy with. So if you think of our target audience, we were our own target audience in that sense. You know, so we, we were just making music for ourselves. It's that, I, of course, it's that idea of you build it and they will come. And I think in broadcasting, my whole career, not that I'm broadcasting so much now, has always been I want to make something that I like and hopefully that'll drop with an audience. And, and if it does, awesome. And if it doesn't, at least I'm doing what I love. Yeah, but in this case, I suppose it was it was also just just build it. It's not necessarily that anybody's going to come. Right. You know, people <laughs> might not turn up. And that in itself is okay, you know. And, and so that's how we wanted to... To go about it so you know given my experience and bruce's experience we've got a lot of contacts in the industry and a lot of friends in the business and and you know we kind of could have started down that route and and put snippets and tasters out and 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 tried to do that but we were very careful that we wanted to finish the creative part of the process to a point that both of us were like you know what we're really happy with this bunch of songs that represent us and feels good now if anybody else wants to listen to that that's that's also cool you know um that sounds very arrogant to say that doesn't it but no. um no because it's, 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 it's actually not that far away from what i said i said build it and they will come the truth is what i mean is build it and they might come you know so, yeah, yeah, but, that, but it's building yeah it. that's the thing yeah, yeah exactly and so of course given our experience and some of the commercial experience and what we enjoy listening to as fans 
the, inevitably the music hopefully is going to come out in a fairly palatable form. It's not yeah, going to yeah. be some etheric fusion of of stuff that you know is going to have such a niche audience. So the kind of music that we appreciate is that that what you know we grew up. You know, the, uh, some of the references there are sort of Bruce Springsteen, the early days, and Tom Petty back in the days. You think of that whole 90s era of Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, that sort of stuff. More modern, more modern sound of, say, um, The Killers or The Flaming Lips and a lot of these other bands. And so we've kind of, I think, got taken those influences and put them together. So there's a bit of new stuff in there, there's a bit of retrospective stuff in there. And, yeah. You know, we're, we're just at a point now where we're comfortable to let it fly. We'll see what happens. And we're pretty excited because obviously we've got a single out. But again, let the chips fall where they may. It's all good. I like it how um, you talk about the new music, you know, kind of newer music, talking about Flaming Lips. Flaming Lips were formed in 1983. Is that once again a thing that shows our age? When we're talking about the new sound of like the Flaming <laughs> Sorry, Lips. They were formed in 1983, brother. <laughs> 1983 damn okay i need a i need a more modern reference um when did the killers form when did the killers form they've probably been around for like 20 years a, i'm too. on i'm on wiki right now that's what i had a look. okay do it do it let's uh, have a look, have a look. <laughs> the killers come on come up the killers da, 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 20 years ago brother formed in 2001 so Two even there yeah 2001 <laughs> <laughs> so we're like we're, we're vintage even before we start oh but that's I, even but, but even like you think about lord i mean lord won all those grammys last year didn't she uh no i think it was 2014 mm, right seven yeah, years no, ago true. Time for, we, yeah we're definitely we're definitely getting older because time is do you know why do you know why time goes past i'm um, this is a bit of a digression but someone said this to me okay. the other day and i think that kind of makes sense so when a one-year-old has a year go up that's 180th of their life when a forty-year-old has a year go past, that's half, that that's one fortieth left of their life. So I reckon that's actually, obviously, time does not go quicker, but the proportion to what there is left in your life is shorter. One fortieth versus one twentieth, and that's why it feels like as you get older, time goes. That's quicker. true. You have a hell of a lot of future ahead when you're a kid, and you have a little bit less of that future when you're looking at our age. But... Was well, just going to have a look um, when you say you're not going to try to reinvent the wheel when it comes to uh, midwife breaks, but. You know, Bruce's voice is unmistakable and surely there are going to be people who um, liken the sound, especially because of his voice, to eight. There's got to be some references that come up and I think you're, I don't know if you will because it depends on the style of the of the overall albums, but you, you're probably going to find a pretty willing um, fan base to start with. If you liked eight, you're probably going to like this. Would that be a fair thought at least? Absolutely. Bruce and I started eight together. You know, so it, you know, of of what became eight, it was originally Bruce and I in the beginning. So um, that that sort of sound and ethos has continued through. And you're right, Bruce's voice and songwriting style is very um, characteristic of that eight sound as well. And and I suppose you know my drumming to a degree. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. If if you like eight, I think you will like this stuff. And actually, there is one song that we never released with eight that we've reworked as part of what will come out uh with our tracks as well and i'm really excited for the eight guys to hear that nice. so you know we, we never released that we used to play it live a little bit and we've reworked that we've got some horn sections on it uh horn sections we have a horn section on it uh we've got a vocal choir of bruces in the background multiple <laughs> bruces um got chip matthews playing bass who was with me with the crates with Shea Fu. um and so it's i'm really excited about that track that's it that has a very unique feel that's definitely not a song you're probably going to hear on the radio but it's a song that i love and we love and i think if you like eight you'll like that song it sounds like uh it sounds like you're more excited about the stuff that other people aren't going to get to hear i.e the non-radio airplay so i can imagine you doing a gig that if you have a few singles that have radio airplay they won't be the ones you're most looking forward to playing not to say that you hate some of your babies we all love our babies equally but the ones that you enjoy most of all to play are going to be not the ones that most people hear because they're not going to be on the radio but this is the thing about music and it's same thing any, anything that you perform if you're doing it live it's whatever is the energy and the mood of that moment so yes yeah there'll be some times where because people 
um, might vibe more off a particular thing because they know it more. It might give you a different energy and you might have, a, you know, you might get that, that feeling back. So it's always a hard one. It's hard one to know. I mean, we're in a position where we haven't played any gigs and we're still a little while away from playing some gigs. So it'll be interesting to see which tunes feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I have to say two of two gigs that I've been to come to mind. Um, one was a band called Jars of Clay and another was uh, a little artist called Michael Jackson that I went to see at uh, Ericsson Stadium. You might have heard of him. He was quite big in the late 80s. Um, yeah. And, and I really did not enjoy those concerts because I could have just put a CD in. They're the two bands that stick out stick out in my mind that go, they sounded l like there was no actual interaction with the audience and they they, right. they could have just been what we heard. So I actually like seeing, I like hearing the songs that I like, but I also like hearing interpretations and artists and stuff playing with music on stage because you're not going there to listen to a CD. You're going there to experience no. the live show, which kind of feels like it needs to be different from the CD. So I like the idea of things being slightly different or different each night. I think it's a, that, that would, that would suit my, my style of enjoyment watching a gig for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, yeah, if you, if you go to see a show, you want to go away feeling that you've experienced something unique and you've been in a particular moment that's never going to happen again. Yeah. Um, and if something's very formulaic and is just going through the motions, then yeah, you do get that sense. What you don't want to walk away with is, oh yeah, I'm I'm one of a whole bunch of people who could have seen this any night of the week. You know, that's I mean, what a terrible reaction to a gig. You know, you want to you want to leave thinking, damn, you know, I was I was there, I was there, that person wasn't there, I was right there, yeah. and I, I felt that way, and I still feel this way, and you're feeling it for days, and then years later you remember that gig. Yeah, that that's those are the moments you look for. Or the, the, or just the flip an aside. The flip side to that I'm is, just, you go. Oh no, I was just I was just going to go back to a point that you made about jars of clay. Yeah. Um, was this in Mata Mata yeah, when yeah, you yeah. saw them? Yeah, yeah. On the main stage. I, I introduced jars of clay on that main stage in Mata Mata. They were all sitting on couches was, and stuff. I remember saying, ladies and gentlemen, jars of clay. <laughs> and I had to I had to throw out, they had these little glow stick things. Right. And I had to like throw them out into the audience. And I did one of those really lame things where you kind of spin to throw it. And I and it kind of didn't leave my hand at the right time. And I ended up throwing it into the side of the stage. <laughs> It was really not a good look. I don't remember that. But anyway, sorry, I digress. I was going to say the flip side to what you're saying is about, you know, not having the same gig every night. The The other side of that is, and I'm thinking about the Foo Fighters when I'm saying this out loud, is they always seem to have such a different gig. Like I remember, or, or you too, are a bit the same, you know, like the, the guy who the song about One Tree Hill is about, he was at a particular gig. So the, there was a, a particular moment in that gig where they acknowledged him, that kind of stuff. You feel like you missed out. Because then all the gigs aren't the same. You're like, oh shit, I wasn't there on the Sunday. I was there on the Saturday. What happened on the Sunday? And it really is. It feels like a completely different experience, and I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, and that that's what that's what all artists should strive for when they're performing. You know, yeah. you, you don't want people to walk away and think, oh yeah, if I saw you yesterday. I'd be seeing exactly the same thing. So yeah, I, hey, I would totally agree. With you. Dude, it's been an absolute pleasure to uh, to speak to you today. But weird, but weird because you know. You've known each other right. for a, quite a long time, but but still fun as well. Right, right, right. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's a comfortability there, Pat. There you know, is. It's nice when you just there chat is. and you feel like, yeah, this isn't awkward. Uh, Midwavebreaks.com, I'm assuming, is the place we're going to be sending people. EP out soon, featuring the debut yep. single, Lemonade Hand Grenade. Very cool graphics there. Was there a certain wife involved with those graphics, I wonder? Yeah, yeah, a certain wife, namely my wife, <laughs> who's pretty awesome um, graphic designer. So one thing that... Um, I had sent her an email about actually to change is to say is to actually put the date on there because uh friday the 23rd is when that comes out so that'll be available on all the uh, your favorite platform whatever you want to use spotify itunes however so um, this this so friday this friday you can download it you can stream it you can hear it in all its glory <laughs> ah this is exciting so the single <laughs> that we're putting out it's called lemonade hand grenade right so how's this for like weird th three degrees of separation um we know a guy who knows a guy who happens to know a guy called mark needham you might not recognize this name but he's a 
Grammy Award winning engineer producer in the US. And so we had, we've done, so where I'm sitting here is in the hills of Welcome Bay. This is Bruce's house. And we've recorded in a spare bedroom of his house. Uh, and we've done it all ourselves. And so we needed to get it mixed professionally. So we were thinking, where are we going to do this? And wouldn't it be amazing if we could find someone to do it? Long story short, we know one person who knows another person who works with this guy. He happens to be the dude who mixed the killers, Mr. Brightside and worked um. with Imagine Dragons. And this is one of those weird sort of COVID environment situations where a lot of these big wig engineers are not necessarily um, sitting in massive studios doing all these big projects at the moment. They're doing downtime stuff. They're working from home. They're doing other things. There's a lot more hustling going on. And so we were able to kind of sneak in the back door through a conversation, say, hey, uh, have a listen to this. Do you have time? Could you do this? Mark listened to the song. He really liked it. He said, yeah, I'll mix that for you. Lemonade Hand Grenade coming out this Friday, mixed by the same dude who mixed The Killers, Mr. Brightside. That's pretty dope. From two boys two boys in Tauranga. <laughs> and although we've had this whole conversation around creativity versus commercialism, my exaggeration, has there been any interest from, you know, the commercial world? Are we going to hear this on the radio, this one, or not? Uh, you will be hearing it on the radio. So, um, again, I think we're lucky in the sense that um, because of our background and, and experience, we, we have a bit of a foot in the door and we have some contact. So sure. um, we, we've got a lot of the rock radio stations have already said they're pretty keen to play it. And, you know, we're, we're heading up to Auckland this week. We're going to do a couple of interviews and doing a few little radio things and saying, hey, we're midway breaks, you can hear our song and that sort of stuff. So it, it'd be nice uh, if it does get some radio airplay and we'll see what happens. But again, Whatever, man. It's all good. Well, dude, after this hour and a quarter conversation, you don't have to go anywhere. You just tell them to take some cuts out of here. You'll be sweet, you'll be sweet yeah. bro. Just take sweet. some cuts and out of this conversation. You, you know, you can charge them like per second or something. Something like that. Hey, Paul, this has been fun, man. I really enjoyed you coming through. And I'm sure once Midwave uh, breaks uh, becomes, I don't know, it feels weird kind of saying hugely successful because I know that's sort of not what you're going for at the moment. And But... You know, this these interviews are supposed to end with me saying, "Once you win your next Grammy, I look forward to talking to you after that." You know, so but I'll just say, and like, this is the thing: it's not it's not like we're anti that happening. By yeah, the way. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, if, if 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 the music became successful and it was all good, that's that's great, it's all well and good. You know, the important thing is that the music is what you want it to be first, and as you say, anything after that is gravy. It's all good. Do you think you'll like? Have you had conversations already around touring? Like, will there be a summer tour? Do you think? No, we haven't even been there yet. Haven't so we've got to figure out how to wow. make this work as because me and Bruce are two piece at this point. We yep. don't have a full band. Yep. But we have some little whizzy tricks up our sleeves. So we we're, we're gonna work on that a little bit. And then it would be nice at some point to be able to perform them live. Um and to put them before an audience and, and to create those experiences for people. So if that comes up yeah, we'll be up for it for sure. Well, I guess the nice thing is from where you're sitting right now, sort of a three to four hour drive in every direction, you've probably got two thirds of New Zealand's population anyway. So in this day and age where you are, um, it's probably not that difficult to, uh, you know, should it happen to get some kind of little uh, tours going on with a decent population base and off you go. Yeah, and, and we'll see if those opportunities come. I guess the, the difference again is, is, you know, me and Bruce are, we're in our mid forties, you know, we're not going to be jumping in a van anytime soon, playing down at the five bands for five bucks, you know, or down at the pub, you know, we, we're, um, we've done our time. We've done the hard graft in that sense. So yeah, if the gigs come, it's going to be a reasonably comfortable gig. So we'll see. It might rule out a number of gigs and we might not ever play. Maybe we'll so. And I think, as you said, the, the time has come and the time is done. And I think we've done it here again today. So, dude, thanks so much. If people want to check out more about it, Midway, Midwave Breaks, with an S on the end, midwavebreaks.com. But other than that, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, well, let's not leave it another 12 years before we catch up again. Yeah, exactly. No, thanks very much, Pat. It's been awesome talking, man. Um, yeah, and, and you're exactly right. Let's not leave it another 12 years. Let's talk soon.